scripture reading this morning is Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. And I'm reading from the Inclusive Bible. If your life in Christ means anything to you, if love or sympathy can persuade you at all, then be united in your convictions and united in your love with a common purpose and a common mind. That is one thing that would make me completely happy. There must be no competition among you, no conceit, but everybody is to be humble. Value others over yourselves, each of you thinking of the interest of others before your own. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I don't know if you've ever given this much thought, but I think about these kinds of things all the time. Why church? Why do we come? What is the point? I was in a meeting once where this was the topic of conversation, and it was in a different denomination. And one of the things that kept coming up over and over and over again is, well, we're all about social justice. This is where we want to be. We want to do social justice work. And the only way we can do that is as a congregation. And someone would say, yeah, but, you know, there are other organizations and agencies that do community advocacy and social justice kind of work. And quite frankly, they do it better. And then someone would say, yes, but, but we're a community of faith and, and we hold these truths to be so important to us and we believe in the dignity of every person and these are our guiding principles and so we have to be able to figure out how to do this. And someone would say, yes, but there are other agencies and organizations out there doing the same work and by the way, they do it better. And then someone else would pipe in and say, well, what do you mean they do it better? Well, this agency has this particular focus and that's all they focus on and they do really good work around this issue. And this agency, they have this particular focus and, and they do this one thing and they do it really, really well. And everybody pays their dues and if they don't pay their dues, then they don't get to show up. But in the church, we have to take everybody, whether they pay or not. This is what was said. This is the conversation. And since that conversation, I've thought a lot about what does it mean for us to be the church? Because if it was just about social justice, I would say, absolutely, yes, perhaps there was some meat to this conversation, there are many agencies who do many wonderful things, and yes, they do it better than the church. But I think this passage perhaps gets to the heart of something about church and what it means to be the church that doesn't necessarily fit for other agencies and organizations. We can certainly say that other people are united in their convictions. But I'm not so sure that other people are united in love. You look at the mission statement of a lot of agencies and organizations. They talk about purpose. They talk about their goals. They talk about who they want to serve and how they want to serve them. But you don't necessarily have to love anybody else in that organization in order for it to work. In fact, you can be the curmudgeon in the group and be uh, argumentative and combative at every single meeting and still, still meet your goals. But that doesn't work so well for a church. If we are not united in love, 
then everything about church falls apart. Paul is calling us not only to be united in our convictions, but also to be united in our love. And we're to have a common purpose and a common mind. And for him, that common purpose and that common mind is all about sharing the gospel. This idea that God loves you. It's a pretty simple formula, really. And he goes on to say that we don't need to be competing against one another. Well, I don't know about you, but church is one of the few places where I hope we don't have to compete against each other. We're not trying to outsell one another. We're not trying to outdo one another in service activities. We've kind of removed those elements, the things that belong to other organizations and agencies. We don't do that in church. Because our goal isn't to compete with one another. Our goal is to serve one another. And not just the people inside the building, but people outside the building. And we do it from a different place. I may know that it's the right thing to donate my glasses to some organization so that they can recycle them. And that's a good thing to do. But there are so many things as a church that we can do that don't have anything to do with a tangible physical item. We can offer compassion and kindness. We can create stone soup. We have figured out in the church how to feed people, how to love on people, how to care for people at their most vulnerable times. And it's a particular kind of caring that is steeped in the love of God. The kind of caring that you don't necessarily find elsewhere. I've also asked myself the question, if there's no threat of hell, why do we gather? And the reason I asked this question, I had someone talk to me, oh, probably four or five years ago, and said, well, you know, the only reason I go to church is because I'm so terrified of going to hell that if I don't show up, I'm afraid that's exactly where I'm going to end up. And I said, well, what if you just remove that from the equation? Would you still go to church? Well, probably not. I appreciated the honesty. So there has to be something else that draws us together. It can't just be because we're terrified of what might happen when we die. And I suppose for some people that's a really important reason for going. But I'd like to assure you today that whatever God has created, God will draw back to God's self. That I am convinced of. And so, if we remove that threat, what I want to know is, why do we come together? What is our purpose? I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that being united in love, a particular kind of love, is so valuable and so important to how we live every single day that it's imperative that we come together as a congregation. And whether you realize it or not, when some people are missing, we feel it. The link, the connection, it's broken. It's not complete. I notice when Kenton isn't here and when Reggie isn't here and when Nancy isn't here and Marge, Marge isn't here this morning. I notice when these people aren't here. And it makes 
the church feel a little less whole. And it's because we have these connections, these really important connections with one another, that not only lift us up, but sustain us over time. Without being united in love, I'm not sure there'd be a whole lot to live for. I think Paul names it perfectly, if love or sympathy can persuade you at all. These are the things that matter. If your life in Christ means anything to you, this is why we gather. Because we are united in love. We have a common purpose and a common mind. All the things that we do together, whether it's singing on Sunday morning, whether it's praying together, reading scripture together, or even fellowshipping together after service. We do this because we're united in love. And I know from personal experience that if I have something going on in my life, I can call any one of you and you will be right there. And I know that any of you can call me and I'll be right there. That's how church works. I said earlier that hospitality is one of our greatest spiritual gifts, spiritual practices within Christianity. One of the things that I absolutely love about First Congregational Church is that we live that spiritual practice. We are a hospitable people. In line with the idea of stone soup, in the ancient world, if anyone knocked on your door for any reason, the first thing you were to do was offer them a pan of water so that they could wash their dusty feet. And the second thing you did is you would seat them at your table and you would feed them any bit of food that you had, even if it was your last bit of food. That is hospitality. And whether you realize it or not, the hospitality that you have shown the homeless over the winter, the hospitality that you show anybody who just walks in off the street, the hospitality that you show your bank teller or the grocery store clerk or anybody else that you come in contact with, that gets noticed. I've been here now just long enough for people to know who I am and to know some of you are connected with me. And so now when I go into places, oh, I saw so-and-so, and I get to hear stories. Yeah, they talk about you. And I like what I hear. They talk about you in really good ways. When so-and-so comes in, they always make me feel so special. That was the one I got this week. They smile at me and they ask me how I'm doing. And I feel like they really care about the answer. Kudos, guys. You're being the church. United in love. It is my prayer, always my prayer, that as we figure out who we are as a congregation, as we continue to search out our purpose and mission, that the one thing that we keep at the very core of everything that we do is this idea that we are united in love. Because I think that everything, everything happens from that place. I like to think of it as God being at the center of all that we do. Love is at the center. And I believe that if we do that, whatever we undertake, no matter how small or how big, 
it will be fruitful. I'm proud of this church. You guys have made a massive impact on a lot of people. I hear all the thank yous. They may never come to you specifically and say thank you, but they have hugged me. They've cried on my shoulder. And so I'm here to tell you this morning that they recognize the love of this congregation. And they know that we place service above all else. May it be so. Amen.